Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm Remy Poor and I'm a content strategist here at Radiosoft. Uh, we're going to start the presentation in a couple of minutes, but I wanted to give you guys some background on the presentation today. Uh, today's talk is an introduction to machine learning and its applications. Uh, it'll be presented by John Edelin. John is a senior research scientist here at Radiosoft and an accelerator physicist. He specializes in thermionic cathode guns and space charge effects in low energy electron beams. He earned his PhD in accelerator physics from Colorado State University and was a Barding Fellow at Fermilab. And he's also worked on PIP2 and the Advanced Photon Source. Uh, we also have Stephen Webb with us on the line, another senior research scientist at Radiosoft, who will be helping to answer questions during our Q&A session at the end. Uh, for those questions, you guys can go ahead and use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be answering those at, during the presentation as we can, and also in the Q&A session at the end. Uh, as for our agenda, we'll probably be running around 40 minutes or so today for the actual presentation. And then we'll use the rest of the time for any questions you guys might have at the end here. So John, if you wanna go ahead and start your video and unmute, you can take it away. Great, uh, thanks for the introduction, Remy. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, today, I'm going to be giving a presentation about uh, an introduction to machine learning and its applications. I think the, the idea here is to try to keep this presentation at a fairly high level. I'll talk about some philosophical things and then try to get into some practical things uh, to try to just sort of provide people who don't have a lot of machine learning background with some of um, kind of my opinions or my uh, experiences in uh, some of the work that I've done in the field so far. So just as a disclaimer, some of this stuff is mostly based on my experiences and um, my sort of interpretation of different things. And uh, depending on what resources you use, you might hear some slightly different interpretations. Um, I think we have a couple of poll questions we wanted to ask before we get started. Remy, can you go ahead and initiate that? So, great. So what are we trying to do here? Uh, I think the main goal is to try to answer this question, uh, what is machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data science? And then also provide some uh, context for how you might apply machine learning tools for solving real world problems. and. Most of these are sort of geared towards the physical sciences and accelerator physics context specifically. So I'm gonna start with an overview of some high level definitions just to provide some sort of general context. And then I'm gonna talk about some misconceptions. And I think uh, some of these misconceptions are based on my interpretation of how information is presented. And I think that this is important to sort of untangle what some of these things are and how, how we wanna talk about that in a little bit more clarity. I'm then going to provide some context for the machine learning landscape and talk about how we use machine learning tools to uh, solve specific problems. So in that sense, uh, what kind of problems are we trying to solve? So what's the domain? Uh, how are we actually solving the problem? So what's the toolkit that we're using? And then who is interested in a particular solution? So what are our actual applications? So I'd like to start off with just defining artificial intelligence. Um, a lot of times um, in literature, in the news, in different things, people use artificial intelligence a little bit loosely and say, uh, maybe when they mean to say machine learning, I just say artificial intelligence because it's sort of easier for a broader audience to get their to sort of understand or to contextualize. But I think it's important that when we use the term artificial intelligence, we're actually talking about what we mean. So I wanted to just throw up a couple definitions. Uh, Wikipedia describes artificial intelligence as intelligence demonstrated by machines, unlike natural intelligence displayed by humans and animals, which involves consciousness and emotionality. Uh, I like a slightly simpler definition, which is computers that can independently produce similar or more complex thoughts, emotions, or emotions than biological organisms. So essentially, a computer that can do what humans and other biological organisms can do. 
and then the next question is, okay, well, if that's artificial intelligence, then what is machine learning? Uh, usually machine learning is discussed in the context as a subset of artificial intelligence. So if artificial intelligence is a very broad term, then machine learning is just how do we train computer algorithms to reproduce human behavior? In other words, as I said, how do we train a computer algorithm to mimic a human task? And that's really the art of actually training the machine to, to do the thing. How does the machine learn? And then I also want to just talk about data science real quick. So uh, the sort of the work of, of machine learning is all about trying to uh, apply how, try to interpret how humans learn and then use that to try to train computers to do things that humans can do. Uh, oftentimes we use machine learning ideas and machine learning principles to do things that are really just data science. So let's say you want to understand how to interpret um, a particular type of experiment that we do, we may use a machine learning tool to try to understand that, but it's not necessarily machine learning. It could just be data science. We're trying to extract information from unstructured or structured data. And I think it's important to uh, be a little bit pedantic about this just because it, I think it helps when we're presenting our results or we're presenting what we're doing. If we're being specific, then it uh, doesn't cause as much confusion. And that's why I wanted to show a couple of infographics. So I uh, borrowed this infographic from uh, a blog post on machine learning. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to show it is because I think that this can be confusing. If you were to have no background in machine learning and you looked at this, you might say, oh, this is sort of how all these things relate. And the reality is that there's some things on here that don't necessarily, that aren't ex mutually exclusive. So. A good example is uh, recommender systems are uh, underneath unsupervised learning and clustering. And sure, like clustering is a useful tool for recommender systems. That doesn't mean that you can't train a recommender system using supervised learning. Um, the same thing is true for a classification. Classification is traditionally a supervised learning task, but you can also use unsupervised learning uh, to do a type of classification. And I'll talk about that in an example a little bit later. And the same thing is true for reinforcement learning. I mean, reinforcement learning can be used to train a classifier. It can be used to train a diagnostic. It can be used to train a lot of different things. Uh, so if you take a diagram like this at face value, you might sort of miss out on how all these things are connected. Really, uh, the different learning paradigms are ways that we can solve a problem. And then there are tools within those learning paradigms that allow us to solve specific problems. And sometimes it makes sense to use one learning paradigm over another, and sometimes it doesn't. And hopefully uh, through some of the examples that I'll show, it might be a little bit more clear uh, later on. And this is a similar uh, type of infographic, again, with sort of the same types of, I have the same types of complaints, basically. Uh, here, specifically, anomaly detection is called out as being a, a separate area of machine learning, independent of reinforcement learning, supervised learning, and unsupervised learning. While that's not really necessarily true, I mean, you can use unsupervised learning for anomaly detection. You can use supervised learning for anomaly detection. Uh, it just depends on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. So I, you know, I think that if you take some of these diagrams or some of these resources at face value, you aren't necessarily looking at the bigger picture, then you can, I think it can cause confusion in terms of like, well, what actually are we doing? Uh, the other thing is, you know, I, I mentioned this a little bit already about conflating machine learning and data science and why we want to say we're doing data science versus why we want to say we're doing machine learning or at what point is, this, is it we're applying machine learning to a data science problem. Um, very common linear regression is used as the entry point for a lot of machine learning discussions and people, I hear people say, oh, well, it's just linear regression, it's not machine learning or, oh, this is an intro to machine learning, let's talk about linear regression. And I think that from my opinion, or my perspective anyway, linear regression could be machine learning or it could be data science. It just kind of depends on what kind of thing you're trying to do. Are you using linear regression to reproduce human behavior? Then that's a very clear machine learning type of uh, task. On the other hand, if you're just using it to isolate trends in experimental data, maybe you're applying machine learning principles to a data science task. So, I think it's important to just sort of keep that in mind when we're talking about what we're doing. 
uh, data scaling is uh, often introduced with entry level machine learning courses as something that you do to pre process your data set before you do any training. Uh, data scaling is extremely important for any kind of fitting that you're doing, um, whether you're fitting a one dimensional curve or whether you're fitting a large dimensional curve. Pre scaling the data is uh, extremely helpful and a useful tool for a broad range of methods. So I don't Think that it's explicit to machine learning. I think this should just be in our toolbox when we're talking about empirical methods. And then this training and validation splitting. So again, that's often introduced with entry machine learning pro, uh, courses, but it's extremely applicable to any kind of robust model development. If you're, if you're making an empirical model, it's a good idea to break your data up and only fit on a, on a subset of your total data set to ensure robustness. So while it's certainly a useful tool for machine learning, I think it's also a useful tool sort of more generally. And uh, just because we're splitting our data into training and validation sets doesn't necessarily that mean that we're doing machine learning per se. Okay, so what actually is machine learning? Um, there's sort of the three learning paradigms that everybody talks about and they're the, there's you know subsets of these and uh, other areas of learning, especially the newer, like newer uh, work, but uh, the supervised, unsupervised and reinforcement learning are kind of the three primary modes of training. And I wanna thank uh, Aurelie for contributing these sketches. I know she's contributed these to a few different presentations and uh, they think that they do a good job of, of demonstrating what we mean when we talk about these different learning paradigms. So for supervised learning, someone or something knows how to get from point A to point B and provides the instructions. And then you're basically trying to reproduce those instructions. So learning how to drive or learning how to fly an airplane, you have an instructor that says, this is how you do it. And now you need to do it. Um, unsupervised learning, explicit instructions are either not provided or they don't exist. So in some, a good example of this is uh, credit card fraud. So this is an unsupervised learning problem because there's many, many examples of normal behavior, but there's not a lot of examples of fraudulent behavior. So usually what we do is, or what's done is you train uh, a neural network to understand what normal behavior is and then discriminate against abnormal behavior by testing uh, data on the, uh, on the neural network. And then in reinforcement learning, you're learning by interacting with environment. And in this case, uh, an example would be, you know, you burn a hole in the beam line because you made a mistake or you tuned the beam improperly and you only need to do it once because you do it once, something breaks and then you say, okay, well, we learn from that experience and it reinforces the good behavior going forward. So that's, that's learning and that's how we, those are the principles that we use to uh, train the algorithms. But now, Let's talk about problem domains. Problem domains is basically what kind of problem we're trying to solve. Regression is a problem domain, right? Uh, and I think regression is most well characterized by the idea of having a continuous output space. So you're building a model that can interpolate over a range of parameters. You have a discrete data set and you use a discrete data set to train a continuous model. The continuous model can then interpolate between your, your training data points and you have a continuous output space. Uh, a good example of that in particle accelerators is building a neural network based surrogate model as, of an accelerator for use in online modeling. Uh, classification is another problem domain. And I think classification is well described by saying you have a discrete output space. So you're trying to build a model that distinguishes between machine states. And a good example of this is, is there a person in this photo or not? Uh, is this a picture of a cat or a dog? Is this diagnostic output good or bad? Um, these are discrete, you, it's a binary output or it could be a multi-class uh, multi output, but it's discrete. You have some way of saying a cutoff between yes or no, or a cutoff between one, two, or three, and it's not a continuous output space. And then there's anomaly detection. And anomaly detection is, it can be considered as sort of a, uh, related to the other two, but I think it's a little bit different. You're trying to identify outliers or abnormal states, uh, identifying faulty diagnostic data, a BPM, uh, faulty BPM data for in particle accelerators is a classic example of 
anomaly detection. There's a number of people that have been using machine learning techniques to uh, to solve this problem, and it's uh, it's can be very useful. Okay, so that's sort of the high level context. Now I want to get into some more uh, sort of nitty gritty details on uh, the, I'll, I'll talk about supervised learning and I'll also talk about unsupervised learning and I'll just sort of walk through some example problems. So here is a, a basic example problem. You have some data set, it's a one dimensional data set and you're trying to build a model that basically represents this data set and can interpolate between your data points. So here you start out with model selection. In this simple case, we have a one dimensional data set. The model can be a polynomial function and we want to start out by splitting the data into training and validation. And uh, so that's, that's the plot that I'm showing on the left. Next, we're going to train a series of models and evaluate how well they do on the training data. So you just say, okay, we're going to use a polynomial function. We're going to increase the model order. Um, and then we're going to look at how well it fits our data. And generally speaking, when you do this, you're going to uh, see that as you increase the number of order of polynomials that you're gonna start getting, it's gonna better and better fit your training data, but it's going to start doing poorer and poorer on your validation data. And this is sort of the classic uh, example of looking at when your model goes from being in the high bias state to being in the high variance state. And the high variance state I'm showing on the right here. So this bottom plot is showing the RMS error of the fit as a function of the model order on both the training and the validation data. And you can see that clearly as you increase the uh, model order, the training error goes down, but then the validation error starts to go up. And this is overfitting essentially. I and mean, there's lots of uh, things that can be done to avoid overfitting, but the basic idea is having model complexity that minimizes both the error on the validation set and the error on the training set. And sure, this is a very simple example, but the, um, the principles can be applied very generally across a, long, a wide range of more complex models and more complex parameter spaces. So uh, in, in accelerators, a good example of, of supervised learning is uh, for surrogate modeling. And I mentioned this already. And here, essentially, you have a physics model that can be used to simulate the machine. And this physics model is too slow to be run in real time. So what you do is you train a neural network to reproduce a physics model. Uh, and then that can be, the neural network can then be run in the control room to give you real time information about the machine that's based on this physics model without actually having to rerun the physics model every single time. So here's an example that uh, I did built a, um, a, a surrogate model for. We basically have the fast, uh, photo electron gun at Fermilab. And this consists of a 6 MeV photocathode RF gun. There's a focusing solenoid and a bucking coil assembly. It's a UV photocathode drive laser, produces a 6 MeV beam, and it's a 1.3 gigahertz klystron. Uh, the bunch charge for this particular setup is scalable between across a range up to 5 nanokilometers. And then there's also a range of bunch lengths and spot sizes available depending on what configuration the laser is running in. But you know, running a full space charge simulation of a photo cat of a photo cathode RF gun can be time consuming. And if you want to rapidly reconfigure or rapidly change uh, the injector to meet different user needs, then having a surrogate model could be helpful in that case. So what you do is you run a large number of simulations on high performance computing over the range of machine states that you're interested in. For this case, um, there's scanned over the solenoid and RF phases. And then we have two discrete different uh, beam, laser beam parameters essentially that has two different charges, two different spot sizes and correlations. And this results in a distribution of outputs in the phase space and emittances. And just looking at the data set, I mean, with number of, you know, not a lot of inputs, a modest number of inputs, a modest number of outputs, but fitting a polynomial to this is gonna be kind of cumbersome. And uh, this is the point where you say, okay, well, let's just use a neural network because neural networks are very good at uh, capturing these high dimensional data sets and, at, uh, and their continuous functions so they can provide interpolation uh, through the different parameter spaces. 
Also note that this is not necessarily an ideal data set for training because the sampling is very non-uniform, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to work. It just means we might be biased towards uh, different uh, parameter spaces where we have more data. So to train this model, you want to increase the complexity of, of the neural net and then look at the validation and training loss as we uh, as we go to more and more complex networks. Just off the cuff, we said, okay, let's start with 20 nodes per hidden layer, and then let's just increase the number of hidden layers and evaluate the training and validation loss. I generally use Gaussian noise as a regularizer um, in a lot of my models. I find that it works very well in many cases. Sometimes it doesn't work that well. Sometimes there's other regularizers like L2 norm is a good one to use as well. I'm not going to get into the, the nitty gritty on that. I think there's a lot of good resources out there on regularization techniques. Um, my main advice in general is though, just start simple and don't try to overcomplicate it. If a simple thing works, then you haven't spent a lot of time trying to build a complicated solution. And if a simple thing doesn't work, then you can start to add complexity as you go. And with a lot of these problems, uh, sometimes a simple solution is the one that works the best. So here we can clearly see that as we increase the number of nodes, the training loss does get better and better, uh, but the validation loss starts to degrade for three and six layers. So that's clear overfitting, uh, just like I was showing for the polynomial example. So then for the final model, you would wanna say, okay, we'll just use two hidden layers and then maybe you wanna improve your validation loss. So maybe you wanna work with a different architecture, things like that. Uh, this is just a very simple hyperparameter tuning exercise. And then, I mean, the importance of looking at the uh, validation loss over, over training epoch is, I mean, it's important, right? Because if you look at just how well the model fits the data on the validation set, these two cases where we're using two hidden layers and 10 hidden layers are very hard to distinguish by eye. You wouldn't necessarily look at them and say, oh, well, the model is um, overfitting or not overfitting just by looking at the predicted output versus the ground truth output. And the, the reason why, I mean, if you, if you um, look at the validation laws, it's gonna tell you more information because it's, if, you, if you're worried about interpolating, if you're worried about the areas where you're not sampling um, and you're just concerned with, uh, sorry, you're usually worried about what happens to the model in the area that you're not sampling. So it's important to understand that just because it looks by eye that it fits pretty well, doesn't mean that it's going to do well in the area where you don't have as much data. Okay, so that's supervised learning. That's a very uh, a couple of very basic cases for applying supervised learning. Uh, next, I wanna talk a little bit about unsupervised learning. So the, the goal of unsupervised learning is there's two different goals. One. And there, I mean, there are a number of different goals, but these are just two example goals. One is let's label an unlabeled data set. And two is, can we distinguish between known and unknown states? So anomaly detection. Um, labeling an unknown, an unlabeled data set is a, essentially a clustering task. And that's saying, given some data set, can we isolate where there are one type of data versus another type of data? And what are the different tools that we can use to do this? And then for anomaly detection, clustering is a great tool for anomaly detection, but there's other tools out there for anomaly detection, and I'll talk a little bit about those next. So here, here's an infographic about clustering. Uh, I really like this infographic because it's, I mean, it's very dense. There's, you know, uh, quite a few different clustering algorithms here and a few different example data sets. And the idea is to try to visualize very quickly uh, which data sets are good for which clustering algorithms or which clustering algorithms perform better or worse on different kinds of data sets. And the more you know about these clustering algorithms, the more some of this starts to make a little bit more sense than just looking at the, the, the visual. Um, for example, dbSCAN, um, the third from the right, is, is dbSCAN stands for density-based scan. And what the algorithm does is it assumes that you have a uniform density of points, and then it just looks for neighboring points and a certain number of neighboring points that meet that density criteria. And then it just sort of continues tracking until it doesn't find any more points that have met that density criteria. So if you say, oh, I have just a number of clusters that have uniform density, 
and they're sort of folded over each other or there's a circle inside of another circle, it can distinguish between those two because there's the separation between uh, the two different circles is big enough that those aren't seen as being in the same cluster. But for something like k-means or Gaussian mixture modeling, I mean, both of those are based on uh, distributions about a center. So they're not necessarily going to be able to distinguish between distributions that are encompassing each other. Whereas if you have sort of these separate, um, like on the bottom, uh, bottom left here, you see the k-means on the, on the far left and then the three different cluster points on the, um, up from the bottom. K-means can do a very good job of distinguishing distinguishing between those because that's essentially what it's designed to do is to find clusters with about a center. And then Gaussian mixture is similar to K-means only it has uh, it's looking for Gaussian distributions so non-uniform densities. And you might look at this and say oh well there's clearly some algorithms that are just better all the time. Um, that's kind of true it's kind of not true. dbscan is a very powerful algorithm and does work very well on a lot of different data sets but it doesn't always work. And the agglomerative clustering is also very powerful and works on a lot of data sets, but it also, I'll show some examples later where it's outperformed by say Gaussian mixture in something that might look more realistic. So here's an example. Uh, this is just a two dimensional data set and there are by I, there are five clusters. And the questions that I wanna answer are, A, can we label the data set? And then not only is it, it's not just meaningful to label a data set, but we also want to be able to understand how to label future data that are collected in this feature space. So let's say, uh, for example, we have a bunch of machine states and we know how to classify, we know how to cluster the machine states, but we wanna know for next time, quickly be able to say, oh, this machine state is in this cluster or that cluster with the algorithm. So that's what the clustering tool is going to be able to do. We can um, isolate, we can figure out how to label data that's collected later. So I already said, yeah, visually there's five clusters. And of course, in a two dimensional data set, this is easy to do by eye. When you start getting into higher dimensional data sets, it's not always easy to visualize. So then looking at the output of the algorithms becomes more important at that point. So looking at three different algorithms, three different clustering techniques, uh, k-means, Gaussian mixture, and agglomerative, and I kind of already described how those work. Uh, but if you don't have a good way of visualizing your clusters, you might say, well, I don't know how many clusters I need to use as an input to my algorithm. So these, all three of these work by, you say, define a number of clusters that you think are on the data set, and then it runs the algorithm, and then you can look at the statistics of the clustering at the, at the, at the end. So I, I found that it's a useful tool to just say, okay, we'll scan the number of clusters. We'll look at these four statistics, minimum, maximum cluster size, median cluster size, and mean cluster size, and then try to find that knee in the curve where we're sort of trading off the, um, the trivial case, which is all the elements are in one cluster. And then the also trivial case of there's so many clusters for every couple of data points. Um, so that knee in the curve is sort of the, um, that where that trade space is, is optimized. And then you can say for, for this case, it's right around four or five clusters. Obviously we saw the previous data in the data set on the previous slide that there's five clusters, but this is, these three different algorithms are saying, oh, there's somewhere between four and five clusters probably in the data set. So what happens when we actually run that? So we tested it on both four and five and uh, for the top case, uh, top is four, bottom is five, and these are all colored by the label that's determined from the clustering algorithm. And for Gaussian mixture, it can isolate four of the clusters, but two of the clusters, it cannot isolate. And actually, this is true across all three algorithms. It could not differentiate between these top two clusters because they're just too close together. They actually have a fair amount of overlapping data points. And when running this on uh, DB scan as well, we saw basically the same, the same results. So that's, I, I want to point this out because that's, it's, it's definitely a problem. If you have overlapping data, overlapping clusters, it's going to be hard for the clustering algorithm to differentiate that from uh, other clusters that are not overlapping. So in this case, what you might want to do is now that you've clustered, let's say you've used Gaussian mixture on the top left and you've clustered it into four. Now you want to take that um, you want to recluster again on the subsets of data. 
and see if there are additional clusters. And then you could you could automate this whole process and you could say, oh, well, let's just take a cluster, pull it aside. We'll do the same uh, scan of increasing the number of clusters and looking at the statistics and see if there are additional clusters in the data set. Okay, so that's clustering, um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, another thing I wanna talk about real quick is anomaly detection. And if you've seen any of my previous webinars, you know that I enjoy talking about autoencoders. And uh, I just wanna show this really quickly as an example of how a neural network can be used in an unsupervised learning uh, problem to do anomaly detection. So usually when you think about neural networks, you think about supervised learning because you're training or you're optimizing a set of weights to reproduce a given output. The reason why this is unsupervised learning is because in some cases you have a lot of data that you understand, but you don't have any examples for what is considered to be bad data or anomalous data. You, this is a, often a problem in accelerators where you have lots of data during normal operation, but then the number of data points that you have during abnormal operation may be few, or you only have a handful with a given type of label. And if you try to do supervised learning with a sparse data set, it's just gonna be very difficult to, to try to learn what good and bad is. So instead you say, okay, well, we're going to learn good and we're going to just assume that if it's not good, it must be bad or anomalous. And that's, that's, where, that's why it's unsupervised because you're not actually explicitly training the neural network to identify what a bad state is. You're explicitly training it what a good state is and then applying a threshold detection for uh, when you're not in a good state. So in the autoencoder case, you're basically learning identity transformation for a data set. And while you're doing the identity transformation, you're reducing the number of nodes down to a latent space. And this, is, this can be used for dimensionality reduction as well, which I'm not gonna talk about, but it's, a, it's another use of autoencoders. So we've done some work on this with detecting faulty magnet power supplies. And this is a great test problem as a starting point because with magnet power supplies, you tend to have lots of data where they're running well and you don't have any problems. And then suddenly the magnet fails and you lose the beam. Um, so how do you, and this doesn't happen that often and you only have a handful of examples. So that's why this becomes a good candidate for unsupervised learning because you're not gonna be able to directly learn the relationship between um, a magnet data and a predicted fault. So instead you say, let's just learn what good is. So we have 1300 power supplies, uh, a bunch of different sectors, 40 different sectors, each A and B. So there's, and this is for the APS storage ring, uh, it's just an example problem. Uh, we're interested in this case, we're looking at the quadruples, the sextuples and the correctors. So we're not looking at the dipoles. And the question is, can we predict if a fault's going to occur? So the idea is to train an autoencoder on reference data set. In the reference data set, there are no faults that occur anywhere in the vicinity of the training data. And then once we've learned how to reconstruct the, uh, the reference data, then we can test it on uh, examples where we do know that there were faults that occurred and see how well this method performs. So the totally unsupervised way of doing this would be to say, let's set a reconstruction threshold error of 0.6 so that all of the reference data is flagged as being good. So there's no, even though we have some reconstruction error, uh, there's, we're just saying, okay, that, that's okay. It's an acceptable variance. And anything outside of this will be flagged as being uh, faulty. And the difference between the top and the bottom plots are just the top plot is looking at the reconstruction error magnet by magnet. And then the bottom plot is looking at the reconstruction error aggregated over all the magnets. So it's an RMS quantity. And we did, for this study, we did have some data that was collected right before a fault. So that we were able to, doesn't actually include the, the you know, seconds when the magnet tripped off, but there is you know, hours leading up to that time. So the idea is, okay, are there precursors that exist in the data set? And the thing was, if we set the reconstruction threshold based on zero, using 0 0.6, which was based on the reference data, uh, then 8% of all that data was tagged as faulty, 8% is actually a lot of data points. There's a, a fairly big, fairly big data set. There's thousands of samples inside of the quote unquote uh, faulty data set. So like time, time samples, sorry, not examples, but um, that's a little bit in the weeds. 
anyway, uh, in this case, you can correctly identify 16 to 26 magnet faults as being without actually explicitly learning that there's a fault that's going to occur. You can correctly uh, identify about half, a little, little more than half of the data as being faulty. And then if you play with the reconstruction threshold, then you can potentially get for a small amount of false positives, you can get a 100% true positive rate, which is uh, pretty useful as a diagnostic tool if you, if you wanted to do something like this. So I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, I know I covered a, a lot of different things and uh, went through a pretty broad range of, of uh, discussion. Uh, happy to continue the discussion and uh, hope that this was helpful. Thanks so much, John. That was a great presentation. Uh, we are going to start the Q&A session now. So if you guys who are listening want to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, please go ahead and submit those. Uh, Stephen and John are going to answer as many as they can. Uh, so Stephen, if you want to unmute, you can take it away. Yeah, sure. So uh, on asked uh, about the low energy RF gun uh, simulations in the model. Uh, what's the accuracy between the trained model and the simulation code that you were using? Uh, and how is the speed comparison between the trained model and the original simulation code? Sure. So the I'll start with the speed one, just a little bit easier to answer. The uh, we're using Opal, uh, Opal T, and the full space charge simulations were on the matter of minutes or so, depending on uh, how far down the LINAC we took the beam. And then the neural network, once it's trained, executes in a matter of milliseconds. So it's, it's quite a lot faster. Um, and then as far as the accuracy, I mean, it can be, it can be quite accurate. I think I showed the, um, I can go back here. So this, this plot on the left gives you an idea. This is, I mean, this is all, it's all rescaled. So you have to, uh, if you want to get it back into physical units, we have to run it back through the scaling. But essentially, it's the predicted output of the neural net compared to the ground truth from the simulation. So everything is falling right on the line. So it's, it's pretty accurate. And, and you can, if you have more data, it gets even better. So uh, yeah. John, in this case, uh, out of curiosity, how would you interpret the loss function? Like, is there is there a straightforward physical interpretation of the loss? That's a good question. Uh, I haven't actually given it that much thought for this example. I know that in some discussions uh, in other collaborations, we're trying to um, couch the loss in terms of sort of physical metrics for the model. I'm sure that I mean it's it's RMS error, so it's RMS error on scaled outputs. So if you were to take the RMS error and then uh, look at sort of individual errors and then rescale them, then you can say, oh, well, this is just the error for this particular metric or this particular physical parameter. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. Does anybody have any other questions? Uh, if so, please uh, pop them into the Q&A window. Yeah, okay, so Lucas asked, uh, could you give examples of using machine learning for IDs? Uh, what do you mean by IDs? Yeah, I was gonna say, well, I'm not sure what you mean by IDs, like, like yeah. Could you please- For people, again? like for people identification? Oh, undulators, insertion devices. Undulators. Oh, insertion devices, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we're, we have a project right now that is focused on machine learning for actually beamline tuning. Um, I mean, I think you, for insertion devices, I mean, you talk about optimization of insertion devices. If you wanted to do a design of a, uh, like a magnet design, the magnet design can be computationally intensive and it might be useful to train a surrogate model on a number of input parameters for your insertion device and then used and optimized in the surrogate model. There's actually a nice paper in PRAB by uh, the Arley and the group at Slack about using surrogate models for optimization of um, uh, photo injectors. And they basically saw that 
you have to do a lot fewer iterations of the simulation to train the surrogate model than you would have to do if you optimized over the simulation uh, directly. So in that case, it might be more efficient to just train a surrogate model, do the optimization, and then sort of test your uh, results in a, in a simulation, like if you're using a radiator or something like that, you could probably do that. Thanks, John. Uh, does anybody have any other questions? All righty. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Uh, yeah, if no one has any further, oh wait, we do it with one more. Oh yeah, Ann has a f another question, which is, could you please give us some suggestions or comments about TensorFlow and PyTorch? I don't have any experience with PyTorch. I, I use TensorFlow uh, with the Keras API and I find that it works fairly well. Um, my, my biggest recommendation is always to just, like I said earlier, to start as simple as you can and then try to build complexity from there. Great. All right, any last few questions? Um, and a reminder, you can always also reach out to us after the webinar is over. Uh, we have, we'll give you those contact infos. Yeah, thanks, go to the, the last slide there, John. Um, we always welcome questions as well. All righty, well then let's start wrapping up here. Um, thanks everybody for attending and thank you, John, for giving that great presentation. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email with the recording of this webinar as well as uh, access to the slides probably in the next two weeks so keep on the lookout for that uh, but otherwise yeah just want to thank you guys for attending and keep an eye out for future webinars i uh, hope you have a great week thanks everybody thanks everyone